You guys see any students in the hallway? Were there any students out there? Were there any students in the hallway? In the lobby? No? Well, there must have been because they're coming in now. Am I waiting so I can start any time?
very much. Good afternoon. How's everybody? Well, uh, what you guys probably don't know is that you guys are being streamed live to, I think I was told about six billion people. Well, no, probably like 12. But nonetheless, um, I am going to speak with you all about something today that I think is really important. And as you see all of this other stuff up here, I, I'm going to split this session. Uh, and this is going to be a very exciting time, I believe, for you guys, because in addition to what I have to speak with you about, I'm going to share the stage with uh, Dr. Steve Maddox, who's going to talk to you about music technology. But for now, um, I would like to speak with you guys briefly about something that I think is really important for all of us, not only as musicians, but just as people. And uh, I kind of I have titled this success through the journey, but what is a journey? And I think a journey is something that we all will experience, but a journey is something uh, that is our path in life to help take us to where ultimately we're going to end up. Uh, and the focus of our, of our journey should not necessarily be the final destination, but what we learn en route. And so, in part, when we start talking about our journey, you have to ask the question, what is your vision? Each and every one of you, what vision do you have for yourself? There's a great author by the name of Sarah Lewis. She wrote a wonderful book entitled The Rise. And in her book, she says, we thrive not when we've done it all, but when we still have more to do. And I found that to be very profound as a musician because I, I think we get a lot of satisfaction not only in accomplishing things, but when we accomplish whatever that might be, whether it's learning a solo, finally learning how to play a scale or figuring out a certain chord, part of that excitement comes because we now know that we can go even further. After we've achieved whatever that goal, we see that there's now more that's possible. You know, uh, I was sharing with some students earlier that uh, the definition of success is when preparation meets opportunity. I've often said that all of us will have opportunity. It's just will we be prepared to really take advantage of that. Um, one of the things that I had to learn early on was the importance of taking chances. Quite often when I'm speaking with students, I ask them, how many of you all get nervous? Like right now, if I were to ask you, you all, by a show of hands, how many of you guys get nervous when you play? Okay, that's fair. And is it safe to assume that you're nervous because you're afraid of making a mistake? Is that safe to assume? Yeah, I think most of us. You know, the wonderful thing about music, though, if you make a mistake, nobody's going to die, right? If you play the greatest solo anyone has ever heard, when you finish that solo, it's done. If you play the worst solo than anyone has ever heard, when you finish, it's done. Because it's all about what's happening in the moment, right? Well, many, many years ago, uh, I had to learn the hard way that success and failure is cyclical, right? If you're not reaching for something, you really don't have to be concerned about failure. You know, when you're reaching for something, part of the idea is that you want to be able to achieve something. You have a goal in mind. But one of the things that's, that keeps us from taking chances is a fear of failure, fear of making a mistake. And I can guarantee you, if you listen to jazz recordings enough, you will have heard a lot of mistakes. And probably some of your favorite solos were full of mistakes. Right? So what are mistakes? Usually those are just things that we didn't intend to do. But great master musicians have found a way to take what they didn't intend to do to create something else out of that. You know, I'll tell you an interesting story. Back in 1991, I was on tour with Benny Green. And we opened, we did a six-week tour opening up for Tony Williams. And uh, May 16th of that year, I remember like it was yesterday, we were in uh, Philadelphia at the Chestnut Cabaret. And behind the curtains, you know, I would always stand peeking through the curtains watching Tony Williams. And he would always open up the set with the drum solo. And I remember this particular night, he played something coming off the hi-hat onto the snare drum that he did not like. And when he played it, he played 
We said, ah. Then he thought for a second. He did it again. Hmm. And he did it again. And he did it again. And he developed that mistake until three or four days later, it was a Tony Williams masterpiece. And so how was it that he was able to really take advantage of that moment? He was aware of what was going on while he was playing. And he didn't dismiss it as a mistake. It was just something that happened. And I remember asking him, and of course I wouldn't ask about it that night. I waited a few days later, and I asked him about it. And he said, you saw that? I said, yeah, I was backstage. I was looking through the curtains. He said, yeah, man, that's not what I was going for, but I realized what I did was hipper than what I was going for. He said, always be aware of what you, what's going on at any given time, because sometimes that's when the magic happens. And so that got me thinking, and it got me thinking back to a previous situation um, that I had dealt with just a few years before. Um, while I was in college, I, I joined the band of this trumpet player by the name of Freddie Hubbard. And I was with him for eight years. And uh, I'll never forget, um, we, we had a, a few very intense conversations. But, but one of them, uh, he told me uh, shortly after I joined the band, he says, Carl, you have to learn how to play with more intensity. I said, okay. And so I started playing louder. And he says, uh, I didn't ask you to play louder. I asked you to play with more intensity. I said, okay. Well, at that time, I thought intensity was about volume. So uh, I said, well, what do I do? And he gave me this look of disgust, like, I can't believe you asked me that question. But of course, he didn't say that. He says, what do you do? Okay. He said, okay, uh, check out Max Roach, Elvin Jones, and Connie Kay. I said, okay. But that confused me because I'm still thinking about volume. Because Max, okay, Max could hit the drums. Elvin could hit the drums. Connie Kay, drummer with MJQ, was known as kind of a soft drummer. So I checked him out. A couple of months later, we were talking. He says, okay, Carl, um, I, I, I hear it's getting better, but it's not quite there. Now check out these three drummers. And he gave me three more drummers. Every couple of months, same thing. Okay, Carlos, you know, it's getting better, but uh, it's not quite there. He said, now check out these three drummers. Now, this had gone on for nearly a year. So finally, he says, okay, Carl, I got three more guys for you to check out. I said, Freddie, hold on a second, man. This, you know, you just three drummers here, there's three drummers there. You know, I, I, why do I have to go through all of that? I mean, just tell me what I need to do, and I'll do it. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, man, I just, you know, just three. He says, uh, let me ask you a question. He said, what instrument do you play? Uh, I said, I play drums. He says, what do I play? Uh, I said, you play trumpet. He says, yeah, and if I have to tell you how to get to it or what to do, I'll find another drummer. Which would you like to do? And I said, oh, I'll figure it out. It was a very humbling moment. A couple of months later, we're on the road, and he says, uh, I need to talk to you. So I go to his room. He says, have a seat. So I'm sitting. And he says, um, do you know why I was going to fire you almost a year ago? Of course, I started shaking. I said, well, no. He says, I was going to fire you because I thought you were looking for shortcuts. He said, there are no shortcuts in jazz. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, I was asking you to play with more intensity, and you wanted me to give you the answer. He says, I could have told you what to do that night, and you would have given it to me that night, but you would have learned nothing. You see, but because now it's taken almost a year, you've had to figure it out yourself. It's called what we call trial and error. And so because you've gone through the journey, now not only do you know how to play with more intensity with me, but you can play with more intensity with Sarah Vaughn, Chick Corea, Jackie McLean. Herbie Hancock, or many other people that you may play with. He says, Carl, one of the things you're going to have to understand as a musician is that you're going to have to learn the lessons along the way and not just try to figure out your final destiny. This is not a race. There is no finish line. That was one of the best lessons that I ever learned. 
And for all of you all, I think it is a lesson that you all have to learn, which is to embrace the journey. So many lessons that you learn in root. People sitting next to you right now have some information for you. There are always lessons to learn. There's so much to embrace. And so, you know, I think about that, and I think about this need for us to be students for the rest of our lives, for us to be serious students of life. Uh, I, I was always so excited to be around people like Freddie Hubbard, people like Dizzy Gillespie, people like so many other master musicians that I've been blessed to, to have had relationships with. And I remember uh, after a concert in Madaran, Japan, on August 16th, I don't know why so many things happened on the 16th, and it's, it's kind of weird that I always remember dates and numbers, but on the 16th of August, 1987, Backstage after a concert in Monterau, Japan with Dizzy Gillespie, uh, I, I, Dizzy was the kind of person who was always laughing and joking. You know, whenever, if he, if he really loved you, he would always show you rhythms, and he would show you these rhythms, right? And so we were backstage, and you know, everybody's sweating, we're just talking, and Dizzy said, Carl, I got this other rhythm for you. He showed me this, and he started showing me this rhythm, okay. So we went through, and okay, figured out the rhythm, so. Half an hour later, we're talking. And I said, Dizzy, I said, man, I, I really wish I was around in the 40s and the 50s. And Dizzy was, you know, the kind of person who was always jovial, laughing, you know, meet you for the first time, hug you, treat you like you were family. But he got really serious. And he said, Carl, why would you say such a thing as if I had insulted him? I said, well, man, I just wish I could have been there when you guys were creating bebop. He said, well, that, that was a special time. It was, he said, but you have to remember, Carl, that for you and for all of us, really, the most important time is whatever time that you're in. He said, because you have to understand that the way that great art is created is that there's a foot in the past and there's a foot in the future so that you're moving forward with a sense of tradition. Now, this lesson preceded the other lessons, or particularly the one with Tony Williams, but it all at some point started to come full circle about the journey. And so when I look at this conversation, I look back at this conversation with Dizzy, this was someone who was at the forefront of not only bebop, or Afro-Cuban jazz, and so many other different things, but he was always interested in exploring, always interested in trying stuff always interested in, in just sitting down learning from other people. It didn't matter if you were young or old, experienced, inexperienced, it didn't matter. He was just a student of life. And this is part of what I would like to impart upon you all to encourage you all to be that, a student of life, someone who just sucks up information and always asks questions. You know, I was telling someone earlier today that for me as a, as a musician and as an educator, um, the thing I remember most when I meet young musicians is it's not really the talent. I mean, I travel all over the world. I, I meet talented students everywhere. But I often say that character is more important than talent. And see, and character is that thing that makes you practice when you don't want to. Character is that thing that makes you only do 15 minutes of your hour-long lunch so you can get back to your instrument. Character is that thing that have you have questions when no one else does. You know, those are the kinds of intangibles that you all have to, to possess to be successful as a musician. This is all part of, and has to be part of your vision, part of your journey. And again, if you've noticed since I've been up here, I've not said really anything about technique, how long you've been playing, I've not even been specific to talk about the genre of music because it really doesn't matter. This is, I think, applicable whether you like jazz or classical or bluegrass or orange grass or bebop or Billy Bob. Where's my man Billy Bob? There he is. But it really doesn't matter. But just embracing music. Embracing the journey, accepting everything for what it is and being able to learn from it. So, uh, again, um, as we talk about the journey, and again, we talk about vision, one question is, how do you create a vision? What is your vision? Uh, I remember seeing an interview with a dear friend of mine, Terrence Blanchard, and he was talking about a conversation he had with Wayne Shorter. 
And Wayne Shorter told him once, he says, you know, it takes courage to be happy. And he and I talked about that. And I said, wow, it takes courage to be happy. Well, what is, how does that play into a vision? Well, for a lot of mu musicians, we get into a phase sometimes where our idea of where we're supposed to be is based on what we think other people will make other people happy. Like, okay, well, I really like this music, but if I play this music, well, what are you going to think about me? Or what do they think about me if I write this kind of song? As opposed to just being honest with yourself and say, as a musician, this is what I have to offer. And I think it's really important for us to get to that point, to be able to understand and clarify the vision for ourselves and, 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 in, turn, and, and in turn, finding out a way to, to perfect that. Um, as I'm about to wrap up, there's a, a, something else that, uh, that words of wisdom that, uh, that I got many, many years ago that helped to really kind of cement my way of thinking now. Um, one of my mentors was this guy who played drums. And I remember uh, as a kid, prior to meeting him, long before meeting him, I would listen to him on record. And I was always so fascinated by his technical facility on the instrument. I was always amazed by the way that he got around the instrument, the way he orchestrated, uh, how clever and intelligent his solos were. And I remember we were at a club in New York, and uh, I asked him, we were just having a conversation, I said, what do you, what do you practice? He looked at me, he says, uh, singles and doubles. That's all he said. So I waited a little while, we're talking some more. I said, so, so tell me, you know, what, what, what you, what, you know, when you're at the drums, what, what are you working on? He said, singles and doubles. So I figured, you know, people are walking by, he don't want people to hear his trade secrets. So I waited a little longer. And I said, uh, so I figured I would, you know, dress it up a little bit. I said, see, you know, when you're just at the drums and you're trying to figure some stuff out, you're trying to get to something, what, 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 are you, what, are you, what are you working on? He said, singles and doubles. I'm like, come on, man. So I, you know, this went on for about 20 minutes. So I said, okay, I got to figure out how to maybe rephrase this. And I couldn't figure it out, so I just got frustrated. I said, just, 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 just tell me what you're working on. He says, Carl, you're waiting to hear something different. And I keep telling you the same thing. Singles and doubles. As a drummer, everything you play is a single, double, or multiple bounce, period. And I was like, okay. I had to think about it. And then suddenly, all of these solos that I had heard of his on record started going through my mind. And he was right. Now, I bring this up because quite often when we're going through our journey, we sometimes think that all of the pieces of the puzzle are going to fit nicely together. And sometimes what we find is that part of the puzzle is over here, part of it is here, part of it is there, some of it is back there. Because years later, someone said to me that everything complicated is a compilation of simple things which simply means that anything difficult is just a bunch of simple things put together. If we want to talk about music, if you want to learn 13 chords, you've got to figure out triads, right? Now, Max Roach, everything single, double, or multiple bounce. Everything complicated is a compilation of simple things. That's what Max was talking about, right? Mastering the fundamentals. That's all a part of that journey. It's all a part of the vision trying to figure out how to master this music, trying to figure out how to master that instrument. It's about mastering the fundamentals, right? So again, I go back to all of these lessons that I have encountered. And, and again, I think that that process is ongoing. Uh, part of the joy of, of spending time around young musicians is that I learn a lot of things from you guys, different ways of holding the stick, different ways of hitting the instrument. 
And it always comes back full circle that it, it's important for us to figure out a way to tell our story. You know, um, another one of my mentors, and I'm going to wrap it up, but another one of my mentors was the great Art Blakey. And one time I was playing in Paris with Freddie Hubbard, and Art Blakey was on the bill, Billy Higgins was on the bill. And Art used to always take his own drums, but this particular gig, some of the drums didn't show. So we all had to play the same drums. Of course, we were not fortunate enough to have this beautiful set of DW drums with nice Remo heads and all. We didn't have all of that stuff. It was like the bass drum looked like it must have been about 28 inches, and you look at the cymbal, it just fall. No heads on the bottom of the drum. Well, Higgins played, and it was magical, unbelievable. Our play was phenomenal, spectacular, just unbelievable, right? And I played, and it was just horrible. <laughs> it, was, boy, it, was, it was sad. And, you know, and I've always had this problem. In fact, I'm going to try to find a 13-step program I can enter into. That's the 12th step with an extra step in it. And that problem is when I'm mad, I just don't think it's right for everybody else to be happy. So I'm backstage, and after the concert, I'm kicking chairs and throwing boxes and all of this stuff. And Art comes to me, and he puts his arms around me. He says, uh, what's wrong? <laughs> and so to show you how hip I was at 23, I'm going to talk to Art Blakey about my drum rider. I said, my rider's dead. 18-inch bass drum and four cymbal stands. <laughs> Mind you, he played the same drums as did Billy Higgins. He says, let me ask you something. I said, yeah. Uh, do you play the drums or do the drums play you? I said, what? Girl, if you could really play it, it wouldn't matter. He walked away laughing. You know, the last thing you want is somebody to be laughing while you're mad. And I was like, but, but what could I say? He played the same drums. He played the same drums as did Billy Higgins. And so, although it may seem like, you know, all of these things, these stories are kind of all over the place, it still comes back home, which is success through the journey. Figure out what your vision is. Figure out a way to embrace all of the life lessons that are, that are waiting for you. They're lessons that are all, that's just waiting for all of us. If we can slow ourselves down and be open enough to accept them. Are we okay with that? Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for my time. I want to thank you guys very, very much. <laughs> and now it's... it's uh, with great pleasure, I'd like to bring to the stage uh, Dr. Steve Meredith, who's going to speak with you about music technology and some other things. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Horn School of Music here. Most of you haven't seen me much this week because uh, uh, I typically don't have a lot to do with the Juilliard camp. It's mostly Vance Larson, my colleague, that runs everything. But I do want to take just this opportunity to tell you how pleased, how thrilled we are annually to host this event. It is a, uh, it is a huge feather in the cap of a little teeny tiny school out in Ephraim, Utah, that we are able to bring people of the caliber of uh, Carl Allen to Ephraim and all the other great faculty that you've seen this week. So I hope that you, uh, that you know how cool that is because it's pretty cool, uh, particularly out here in the woods like we are. Uh, as usual, the technology has gone to sleep. Can you give me just about one second and I'll set everything back up. So if you wouldn't mind giving me just a sit, talk amongst yourselves.
we'll, uh, we'll keep working at it uh, here. That's, uh, that's the problem when you let stuff fall asleep. Anyway, um, aside from being the music department chair here, I'm also the director of the choral program, the choral and vocal music program. And so you are saying to yourself, what is this guy talking to me about music technology? And since I'm off to such a sterling start here, you're wondering for sure why this guy is talking to me about music technology. But that being said, I've spent a lifetime uh, really as a music technologist. And I want to I wanna say uh, something about that. Uh, I learned music technology and all the other technologies that I use every day, uh, as most of you learn stuff, which is as needed. Um, you know, the, you're, you're messing around with an app, you're, you're whatever, you're having fun, uh, and, and something clicks with you, and all of a sudden you become interested in learning more about that particular program, whatever it is. And the same is true, I think, maybe more so for artists, than it is for just regular lay people. Um, one of the things that you'll discover is that there are people who create art and then use technology as a tool to help them. And then there are other people who essentially use the tool to help them create the art. And I sort of fall into that former camp. So you'll see in my philosophical statement here that I, I believe that technology is best used when it's a tool to help you realize your ideas rather than letting the tool come up with your with an idea for you. Does that make sense to you? Uh, to, me, to me, that's what separates all of you here in the room who are, who are people who can do something. You know, you, you have an idea and now you just need a tool to help you realize it. That, that, that's, to me, that's very cool. So, I decided I would choose just a couple of apps that I was going to actually obviously show you here on the iPad. Uh, a couple of apps and software programs that I think are pretty cool. Um, and uh, if I can, I'll, I'll, still try to, I'll still try to make some aspect of this work. Have any of you ever spent any time with Practica Music? I know there are a couple of kids from Snow that are, uh, with me mentioning that. But any of, the, any of you that are not Snow students, you ever spent any time with Practica Musica? Some of you want to come up and We'll open it up and I'll show it to you. Somebody want to come up? Okay, come on up. Practical music is cheap, particularly for students. And uh, it has a lot of really cool features in it. So, Let's go ahead, and you, you run the rig now. You can say, that is my name. Please begin. And let's say, do it another time. Thanks. Um, so uh, let's see. Let's choose activities organized by topic. And let's go with ear training, since that's, since that's easy. All right, so all of us, as musicians, look at various times to improve our ears. And Practica Musica, I think, has, thank you, Practica Musica, I think, has one of the uh, best ear training programs that is a available. So what, what do you struggle with? You want to hear chords? You want to hear intervals? Chords? Okay. Let's just do single chords then. And you want to do triads. They should do chord ear training. That's kind of a general one. Yeah, let's say open. And we'll come over here and after it opens here. I'll choose level, uh, should we do seventh chords? We'll do level two. So you can arpeggiate. Obviously, we're not playing a seventh chord yet. Or you can just play it. And you'll see that he's got two choices. Is it a minor triad or is it a minor seventh? Well, what do you think? Attaboy. Okay, so go ahead and press that. 
minor triad. Yeah, I just, just go over there. There you go. You see that it gives you, it gives you points and tells you what to do. Now, obviously, since there's a piano keyboard, you can also build it yourself. If you're trying to develop perfect pitch, you can say, hey, that was D minor, right? And I'm going to, and I know it was starting on, you know, on D4 and, and you know, da, 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 right? So there, and of course, this is just level two. There are, as, as my students will attest, that it, it, it can get pretty challenging in practical music. And I, and I think it's, like I say, everybody tries this. You know, Mr. Allen was, was mentioning to you how there are people that he loves to work with that are lifelong students. I go in and run through practical music about once every two weeks just to keep my ears clear. Everybody learns all the time. And I'm a singer, so I got to have good ears all the time. You know, I, I, I don't have something to help me guess. I'm always just guessing. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Take five. There are a couple of other programs. that I really like. Have any of you seen any tune? Isn't that cool? I'll, uh, I'll sort of show it to you the best I can here. So, essentially what any tune is, is it gives you the opportunity to play along with something. And as you're learning it, it gives you the opportunity to slow whatever that is down. So I took something out of my iTunes library. I just inserted it, right? Opened it. And you see it becomes a waveform. It becomes a small waveform here and a large waveform here. Right? If I press play, So you can look at the little thing here that says, well, I'm at, I'm at 100% time. Would you like to slow it down? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. So we go back to the top. And we slow it down. And you'll notice that it doesn't change key. Still too fast. Right? There are several products that do this. By the way, this also changes, um, changes key. singer or somebody that needs, a, that needs something in a different key, you can go back to the original speed. cost 25 bucks and it's awesome. Right? 
In fact, I was comparing notes with somebody the other day, and uh, they came in and said, can you download this on this thing? And they handed me a little 32 gig uh, drive, you know, that everybody just buys while they're checking out at Walmart. And uh, it reminded me that I had bought my first one gigabyte hard drive now 14 years ago, so not that long ago, in the 2000s, and I spent $979 on a one gigabyte hard drive. So you live in a cool time. Now, stuff is way better, and it's way less expensive. I'll give you one more here. Any of you use iReal Pro? Did everybody use that? Cool. I won't show it to you. Um, iReal Pro is another one of those practice things, and it's, and it's sort of specifically for jazz musicians. You know, it gives you it gives you changes, and if you and if you play, if you pay an extra couple of bucks, it even gives you scales. I don't know if I don't know if any of you have um, noticed that, but I think that's pretty cool. Here's a here's ain't misbehaving. I think. Here's my name, Miss Behaven. So. The, the nice thing about living in this cool time is that there's all this cool stuff. The problem is that there's too much stuff. And so you're going to have to find some tool that works for you, that you feel comfortable with. You know, for me, it's not Pro Tools. For me, it's Digital Performer. For me, it's not Adobe Premiere. For me, it's, it's Final Cut Pro. For me, it's not Finale. It's Sibelius. I, I just like the interface, right? So I created a great big, I'm, I'm out of time, but I created a great, not that long, but a fairly long little PowerPoint presentation. If you're interested in me emailing this to you so that you know what I was looking at and what I was thinking about, you just make sure that we have your email address and I'll make sure that I drop it in the, that I drop it in the mail to you so that you, can, that you can get it. We're just about out of time. Do any of you have any any questions about music technology before I wrap up? Yeah, it was called AnyTune. Yeah, I like AnyTune pretty well. Well, I guess aside from, uh, aside from saying thanks for coming, I'd like to say one more thing about music technology specifically, but, but really about your work life. I told you that I got into all of this by the seat of my pants because obviously my doctorate is in choral music, and so I know more about the motets of Akigam than I do about Adobe Premiere, right? That's what I spent my time studying. But I also learned fairly early on that, that the more you know about things that can enhance the experience for your audience. Not only does it help your workflow and inspire you to creative ideas and thoughts, but it also it keeps you coming back for more, and it keeps your audience coming back for more. So whether it's just a, a, a practice trainer or you kind of go whole hog like I have and, and you know integrate video and light shows and you know, I mean, if we had a few minutes, I'd go up there and play a little Bach chorale on the lights for you, you know. It's, I mean, there's, there, there's just an amazing amount of stuff that's possible with MIDI and digital audio, okay? But make sure that you're using the tool and the tool's not using you. Thanks.
Um, this is really coming close to uh, closing out our week with you guys. And, uh, but I think there was a lot of great information given all week. What do you guys think? Was it valuable? So um, before I let you guys go, two things. One, uh, we're going to, after rehearsal today, there will be a, on the table out here, a couple of pads that you guys can write down, as we had discussed previously, songs, standards that you guys want to learn. One of the things that we're looking to do is to create some kind of system where we can stay in touch with you guys throughout the year, where we can send you practice tips, a list of tunes to work on, records to check out, uh, a number of other things uh, that we might feel will be helpful. Uh, how many of you guys are juniors? Okay. Um, so you guys will be, you will be a junior in the fall. Okay. How many of you guys will be a senior in the fall? Okay. First time? First time? Say Okay. You got confused by the question. Well, here's why I asked the question. Um, for those of you who've never been here before, uh, you're probably uh, a little shocked as to what's going on out here in Utah, because especially if you live in Florida, Georgia, one of those places, you're like, Utah? Well, I know there's a Utah Jazz basketball team, but I didn't know there was jazz in Utah. Well, there's going to be a lot more happening. And uh, for a long time, there was just a two-year music program here where there's now a bachelor's degree. And uh, uh, I will be here on a more consistent basis as I'm the artistic consultant for jazz studies. And we're going to have a lot of great faculty coming out. And over the next few years, there'll be even more happening. But also, um, now that you've met Dr. Meredith, you see some of the other things that are being offered here, not only just jazz, but music technology and a lot of other things. So uh, I say all of that to say, as kind of a commercial plug, for those of you all who will soon be looking at colleges, uh, we want you to know uh, that this should be on your list. And I know uh, some of you are saying, well, that's Utah. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are. It's about what you're doing wherever you are. When you say, well, you know, I got to transcribe solos, and I, well, you can do that here. You can do that anywhere. However, some of the things that we're going to be working on for the student, I think, will be pretty incredible. And uh, a lot of great guests coming out uh, over this next year, and a lot of great things happening. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, again, um, I know I will see you all, obviously, before the concert, but this is your last rehearsal coming up. As I was telling some students earlier today, I want to encourage you guys to play to your level of intellect. What does that mean? That means that now at this phase in our, in our preparation for the concert, try to really make sure during this last hour of rehearsal that you, you have your thinking caps on, that you're not making the same mistakes over and over and over, that you're playing great dynamics, great time, blending, Record today's rehearsal. Most of you all have smartphones or an iPad or something. And uh, really try to use that to, to help you uh, just really solidify all of this information over the next 24 hours. And then tomorrow, you don't have to worry about it. Tomorrow, you're just going to relax and play and enjoy yourself and enjoy listening to everyone else because you guys have not heard the other ensembles. So you'll really have a, a great time listening to your friends that you've made here this week. And we're all really excited to have Kurt Whalum out here tomorrow. It's going to be fantastic. So uh, once again, uh, you all should know that we appreciate you guys being here very, very much. And on behalf of all of the faculty, we love you guys. We appreciate you all. And we are so thankful that you all are here and that you guys have worked so hard. So uh, enjoy your last rehearsal. And... Um, Get out. Thank you.